Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, yes, good morning, good afternoon, and, and good evening to, to people who might be listening. So um, I'm going to speak uh, uh, today about uh, the extreme universe, which is, of course, you know, the, the main theme of this series of CTA talks and is essentially the focus of these ground-based Cherenkov telescopes. And I'm going to talk about the extreme universe as viewed from the viewpoint of someone who uses radio telescopes to study the same kind of objects, which are the targets for for the Cherenkov telescope array um, and, uh, and other uh, related arrays. That is the most extreme astrophysics, so exploding stars, accretion events around black holes, relativistic jets, all the same kinds of objects, but observed in the radio band rather than uh, in Cherenkov light from, uh, from high energy gamma rays and particles. So um, the talk's gonna be in six parts. So in the first part, I'm just going to give an introduction to the transient radio universe. Um, uh, and you can essentially divide, as you'll see in a moment, you can divide radio transients into two different flavors. I'll talk you through the briefly the, the physics behind those. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, say a little bit um, about what uh, our observations of with radio telescopes can tell us about the physics of these extreme events, sometimes in unique ways, which really can't be probed in other ways. Later on in the talk, um, I'm going to talk about uh, a number of specific projects which I'm involved in, some which are broader, some which are a little bit more narrow, which I hope you'll find interesting and which you, you know, I hope you'll see are relevant to the kind of science that, uh, that the Cherenkov Telescope Array will be interested in. I'll wrap up the talk by talking about the prospects uh, for, uh, for future radio telescope arrays as we move through a very exciting uh, era from the current very powerful and still relatively new radio arrays to things like the square kilometer array, which will be here um, on a time scale of five to 10 years. Okay, so the introduction, uh, part one of six, the transient radio universe. So there are two types of essentially of radio transients. Um, and the first type and the one which I study primarily myself are synchrotron transients. So these are, this is a synchrotron radio emission from relativistic uh, electrons spiraling round, round magnetic fields, as I'm sure you know. So it's an incoherent process. It's associated with particle acceleration um, and kinetic feedback. So essentially, in every case where you have something explosive or a very fast moving flow in astrophysics, that's transferring a lot of energy to the, to the local environment. It's moving much, much greater than the local sound speed. And so you get shocks and you get particle acceleration. And we've known this for a long time and we've seen this uh, for a long time. Um, in most cases, in a lot of cases, this is really a unique way to actually trying to measure the kinetic energy which was associated with this extreme astrophysical event. So you can do all sorts of very exciting and interesting physics with observations at other wavelengths. For example, X-ray wavelengths will tell you about the temperature of, of the hottest material. Optical spectroscopy can tell you about the uh, elemental abundances. But in many cases, it's really only the radio observations from this shocked ejected material which can tell you about the kinetic feedback. So the images here I show you two very different uh, astrophysical sources. So this is a range of scales from almost the smallest before we had EHT for the and this is for um, this is for the active galactic nucleus M87 stepping up in scales to the very largest scales. And all of the radio emission you see from the relativistic jet in this sequence of images, this is synchrotron emission produced by shock accelerated electrons probably, certainly producing uh, uh, synchrotron radiation from, uh, from uh, uh, relativistic electron spiraling magnetic fields. What you see in the figure on the top right here is something quite different. This is a supernova remnant produced by a massive star which exploded some, uh, some thousands of years ago. Um, and yet the radio emission in this image also, this is radio synchrotron emission produced uh, in exactly the same way, except that the detailed physics of how the kinetic energy from the event was transferred to the local environment can vary. In the case of jets, it's more collimated. Perhaps in the case of most supernovae, it's more isotropic. So the, the originator physics, if you like, of the event is different, but the physics which leads to the fact we see the radio emission is very similar. Now, as well as being a unique path to estimating the kinetic energy um, associated with these events, radio telescopes, uh, radio telescope arrays, I should say, interferometric arrays, they offer a unique combination of things which you can't really do um, with of any other single instrument, um, unless it is an interferometer array, which is that they can offer very wide fields of view. So this is particularly in the modern era, this is because we're using relatively small radio dishes. 
the smaller the dish, the wider the field of view or what we call the primary beam. But when combined together in an array with long baselines between individual elements, they could also, also offer um, very high angular resolution. And that's usually, that's really a unique characteristic um, um, of an interferometric array. But it is worth making a point that in terms of general transient surveys, um, for most classes of object, they're still effectively less sensitive than optical or X-ray telescopes. Okay, so what that means in practice is that while they are fantastic diagnostics of the kinetic feedback and other properties, usually most astrophysical transients will be discovered first um, as a result of optical uh, or X-ray surveys. And of course, we are also in an era of incredible optical surveys, such as the Zwicky Transients uh, Facility, and very soon we will have the, uh, the LSST, LSST Rubin uh, Observatory producing lots of optical transients. The other type of radio transient, which I won't uh, dwell on uh, much in this talk, are coherent transients. So this is essentially transients which seem to operate by something like the pulsar emission mechanism or some highly tuned and extreme version of that. So fast radio bursts are the, uh, the obvious uh, examples of this. These have very short durations and have very, very high brightness temperatures. We can see fast radio bursts at significant redshifts um, which is extraordinary, really, because we, we, we think that these fast radio bursts originate from things, you know, essentially neutron star magnetosphere. So things perhaps, you know, very, very small compared to, for example, a supermassive black hole. The details of the underlying physics is very unclear. It's very exciting and very interesting to study. But the intrinsic pulse narrowness means that we can actually use these fast radio bursts to study the intervening uh, intergalactic and interstellar medium. So here's an example here. This was the first ever discovered fast radio burst, the so-called Lorimer burst. This was a very narrow burst of just a few milliseconds. Um, but what you could see is that as you went to lower frequencies, so that's going downwards on the y-axis, we see the pulse, which are the, uh, the dark bits uh, here, um, arrived at later and later times. And this kind of quadratic delay tells us that we're measuring dispersion in the cold interstellar medium. Um, Radio telescopes are currently the only way to discover these sources. So this is different to the synchrotron transients that I just talked about. These are really essentially being discovered in large numbers now by facilities such as CHIME um, just at radio wavelengths. Now, if I try to put this all into, uh, into a, a, a sort of a, a, a plane or context for all of radio transients, one of the best ways of doing that um, is, uh, is using a, a version of this figure. So essentially what you're looking at here is on an x-axis, you're looking at time scale, time scale of variability, and on the y-axis, you're looking at radio luminosity. Okay. Now, there's an approximate dividing line here at 10 to the 0 gigahertz second, so which you can think of as a time scale of about one second. On time scales longer than this, we typically find and study our radio sources in sequences of images, and that's what I do. Uh, with most of my studies, and at much shorter timescales, going down, in fact, sometimes as short as nanoseconds, uh, uh, a different operating mode um, uh, is used, which is essentially called a beamformed mode, or for, for those of you who are not an expert, you can think of this as the mode which is used to study pulsars. Over in this very high time resolution regime, there are all the standard pulsars. There are some very short uh, pulses observed from some, but importantly, on the same time scales, but at much higher luminosities, are the mysterious fast radio bursts. And of course, there are there are many, there are hundreds more fast radio bursts which could be added to the plot now since China. The incoherent synchrotron sources um, live in this space over here, this blue shaded region. And the reason for that is that synchrotron emission is limited to a certain brightness temperature of 10 to the 12 Kelvin. And we find a whole range of objects from flare stars and brown dwarfs to supernovae, to, uh, to novae containing white dwarfs, X-ray binaries containing black holes and neutron stars, all the way up uh, to, uh, to blazars associated with supermassive black holes. And these are the most luminous objects, and they also appear often to have slightly higher brightness temperatures. That is, their surface brightness appears to be a little bit higher than it should be able to be, excuse me, for synchrotron emission. And that's because they're relativistically beamed towards us in many cases, as are some of the GRBs. So I'm going to mainly be focusing um, on the image plane synchrotron uh, transient. So that was an overview of the, the kind of the, the, the field of uh, or background of radio transients. 
So the first of the sub projects that I want to tell you about is Thundercat. Now, Thundercat is a live survey program which myself and Patrick Vout at the University of Cape Town, we co-lead. Um, and this is an image plane transient survey using the Meerkat radio telescope. So Meerkat is a radio telescope which was inaugurated in the Northern Cape of South Africa uh, just over three years ago and uh, is, is extraordinarily sensitive and will become over a time scale of about five years, will segue, will morph into the first stage of the mid-frequency component of the square kilometer array. So one of the main, one of the main and most successful components um, of the Thundercat survey is to study X-ray binary systems. So X-ray binary systems are binary systems in which there is a relativistic accreting object, which is accreting matter from a companion star. So if I, if I zoom in on this, uh, this artist's impression here of an X-ray binary sort of as viewed from the viewpoint of the companion star, then you have matter which is overflowing through the inner Lagrangian point. It flows down and it produces an accretion disk um, around the central object, neutron star or black hole. Because the, the size scales um, of the inner accretion disk are very small, and there's a lot of energy released there, the temperatures are X-rays, hence these objects are called X-ray binaries. Um, but the, the, the black holes and neutron stars in these objects, we now know they produce very powerful relativistic jets just like the supermassive black holes. And these are sites of some of the most extreme astrophysical processes within our own galaxy. Um, and these we can study in the radio band. It's estimated there are around 10 to the eight. So that's a hundred million stellar mass black holes in our own galaxy. And maybe 0.01% of these are in binary systems. They're really the tip of the iceberg. So what you're seeing here, this is a, this is a projection of our galaxy um, as observed with Meerkat as part of our Thundercat monitoring program. And uh, first you'll note that there is the date which is changing in the lower left-hand panel here. So this is about two and a half years of radio monitoring of the sky. And essentially what we do is whenever we get an indication from other surveys that something is perhaps X-ray bright, then we start monitoring it in the radio band and we do regular monitoring for a long time. So those of you who have worked in the past on X-rays will have seen uh, uh, movies like this for monitoring the X-ray sky, but this is the first time that we've been able to produce such a movie for the radio sky. So all of these sources are within our own galaxy, and every time you see one of these sources appear or brighten, this means that a stellar mass black hole, or perhaps a neutron star within our own galaxy, has undergone an accretion event, has produced a very powerful relativistic jet, which is causing shocks and synchrotron radiation and is happening within our own galaxy. And there's all kinds of knock-on effects for that. There's a lot of injection um, into the surrounding interstellar medium. So this is really a first, this program of monitoring all of these sources regularly all the time and really giving us an insight into particle acceleration in our galaxy um, as a function of time. Let's skip forward to the end of the movie, then let me highlight some sources here. So everything which has a box around it, um, we have discovered it, with our Meerkat observations, a large scale structure around it. And in some cases, these are large scale structures which look rather static. So this is the long term action of a relativistic jet on the nearby um, interstellar medium. Um, but in some of these cases, we've actually observed jets launched for the first time. And we've seen them, them propagate through the interstellar medium and decelerate on timescales for about a year. Now, to put this in context, and I'll come back to this in a moment, in the entire history of radio studies of these kinds of objects, we had one example where we've managed to track a large scale jet for more than one year. We now have already five new examples from Meerkat and it's really revolutionizing this field. And I think this is important for the Cherenkov telescopes because we're really seeing in situ particle acceleration over a period of a year from relativistic jets within our own galaxy and we can monitor them. We can see when they rebrighten and when they might be most active. So let me just focus in on one of these particular objects. This is from Bright et al. 2020, which was published in Nature Astronomy. This is a sequence uh, of images we made uh, with Meerkat of this source and at later times with the VLA. So the thing was, we did not expect, given the relatively poor angular resolution of Meerkat, so I should say Meerkat is an extraordinarily sensitive radio telescope, but at the moment, until it becomes the, the SKA, it's relatively poor angular resolution. So we did not expect to resolve jets from this source, but we did expect to be able to monitor the core black hole for a long time. And in fact, we monitored it in the end for, for over a year. But to our surprise, by around day 90, we were actually seeing a separated component and we managed to carry on tracking this component. So this is the approaching side of a relativistic ejection 
The central line is the location of the black hole and the receding line is the appearance and propagation of the, the ejected material going away from us on the other side. And we managed to detect and track the motion of these jets uh, for over a year as they propagated away from the central black hole. And this really was a, a unique and really exciting data set. I'll just show you a few aspects of, the, of those data, but I won't be able to, to summarize everything um, about those data right now. First off, let me show you the light curve of the binary. So what we see here is um, over a period of about half a year, detailed radio flux monitoring of the emission from this black hole and its associated jets. And I can identify a few phases. I can say that probably what happened around here was an initial very rapid phase of particle acceleration, followed by a phase of adiabatic expansion from a relatively small size initially, which meant the electrons cooled very rapidly and we lost a lot of the synchrotron emission. But then there is a long phase for over a, a, a hundred days or nearly a hundred days where we see the jets propagating through space, but they are not fading away very rapidly. And this means that there must have been in situ particle acceleration. And ultimately we see that this deceleration is happening. We actually see the components decelerate. Um, and then later on, um, well, I should say, sorry, there is a particularly important epoch, which I'll just focus on for a moment, which is here where we observed the one of the ejected components from this black hole at the same time with the E Merlin radio telescope, which is an interferometer in the UK, and with the Meerkat telescope um, in South Africa, we observed them at the same frequency but at very different angular resolutions. Okay, so let me explain why that is important. What it does ultimately is it gives you the energy contained within that component or a lower limit on it. So here are the observations uh, which we made on that date. So what you see, first of all, in this image here, the central black hole is over here where you have the pointer. But if you look at these contours, you can see that they are extended. And this is the Mirka image. And we know, therefore, that there must have been a new component which appeared over here. That's the kind of angular resolution that we get with Mirka. It's enough to say there's a new component, but not really enough to see it in detail. But with our Merlin observations, uh, we managed to find, uh, we managed to see in great detail the black hole over here, but also exactly where this component was here. We were therefore able to, but what we also found, I should say, is that we measured more synchrotron emission, more flux with the lower angu angular resolution telescope. And therefore, we were able to associate this missing flux with the range of angular scales between E Merlin um, and uh, Meerkat. So Meerkat has an angular resolution of a few arc seconds and measured two millijanskis. E Merlin has an angular resolution of about 0.1 arc second and measured 0.4 millijanskis. We can put these numbers together. Measuring the size is really the most important measurement when you want to do the energetics of these ejecta. So we can put them together. And essentially what that tells us is that at 90 days after launch from the black hole, there was still over 10 to the 42 ergs. That's a huge amount of energy contained in these ejecta. Furthermore, this ejected component was still moving superluminally, which is an effect you get from when things are moving intrinsically, not quite at the speed of light, but highly relativistically, which meant that there was still more kinetic energy to lose. So this is a very strong lower limit. And this is a huge amount of energy, much, much lower um, than, uh, than uh, has been often estimated for these kinds of sources previously. Um, the jets, remarkably, the jets from this, uh, this source were also observed in the X-ray band with the orbiting Chandra Observatory. So let me just focus on one of the epochs here. This is from Espin Acetel, where this is clearly, this is where the black hole is, and this is where the uh, resolved jet component is. We can look at the spectrum from radio emission all the way through to the X-ray band, and we see that both regimes are consistent with a single spectrum of, of uh, uh, synchrotron emission from this component. And our best estimates of the magnetic field mean that this means the electrons we're observing in the X-ray band um, are TeV energy electrons. That is, uh, they have Lorentz factors of greater than a million. So we're seeing leptons, electrons, accelerated to extraordinarily high uh, energies in near real time in these ejecta. Well, we saw uh, these ejecta decelerate with time. I'm showing you three panels here, first of all. These are actually now for three different e ejections. And what you see is the distance from the black hole as a function of time. And if something continues to move at the same apparent speed, you get a straight line. But what we're now seeing in every case uh, is that we see these things move uh, uh, in an apparent straight line or, uh, or apparently ballistically for about half a year. 
and then we see abrupt decelerations. So in a nutshell, what, what the Thundercat program is showing us is that we're actually able to track relativistic ejections from black holes in our own galaxy. We're able to measure the internal energy of them. We're able to track them throughout an entire period of typically about one year until they deposit all of their initial launch energy into the surrounding interstellar medium. And by following up on these studies, we're probably going to be able to place some of the, 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 the tightest constraints on the, the real intrinsic energy of black hole jets that's ever been possible. So of course, those, uh, those objects are very good candidates uh, to be high energy sources of the kind of thing that Cherenkov telescopes are interested in. But let me change tack now slightly and talk about um, uh, exploitation of these meerkat data in another direction. So this is a project which is led by uh, Alex Anderson, who's a PhD student here in Oxford, jointly supervised by myself and uh, Professor Chris Lintod. And what Alex has been doing is he's been using citizen scientists to look at the wide field images which we get from Meerkat, which of course contain hundreds of radio sources, and to see if we can, if we can use sequences of those images to actually find transients and variables for the first time in the radio band. So you'll recall that I said earlier in the talk that you know it's easier to find new astrophysical transients or new extreme phenomena for the first time in optical or X-ray bands, but there may be some phenomena which are actually brightest and easiest to find in wide field radio data. And the way that we did this is we did it by employing citizen scientists, that is general members of the public who accessed our data via the Zooniverse platform. So just to explain what I mean, this is, um, this is a single meerkat image uh, which is centered on a very interesting uh, binary system called Circinus X1. So right down here in the center of this, this little nebula in the center is a binary system containing a probably a massive star and a neutron star. And we study this source intensively and we look at how it varies. We're also interested in this nebula, this little thing around it. But this whole field here um, uh, in, within the enclosed circle is about one uh, it's about one degree uh, diameter. All of this is imaged to high quality and there's lots of radio sources in here. And we make multiple sets of images of the same field and we can compare those images to see if we find variables. So Alex, together with our colleagues in the Zooniverse project, launched on December the 7th last year, a project called Bursts from Space Meerkat. And what he did is he presented to uh, enthusiastic volunteer members of the public sequences uh, of images from our Meerkat data where our software had identified sources which might be variable, but members of public eyeballed, looked at them, themselves with their own eyes and brains at these data and classified them as to whether or not they really thought they were transients or not. And the human brain and the human eyes, as I'm sure you know, appreciate, are um, often much, much better than any simple automated software you might be able to write for finding these kinds of sources. So this is a project that's within the, um, the, the, the overall Zooniverse project, which is most famous for the Galaxy Zoo project, but has done an enormous amount of stuff um, beyond astronomy, beyond physics, um, and is the, the largest citizen science project in the world. So what did we get? Well, um, here's an example of what the, uh, the citizen scientists saw when they logged onto the program. So they were shown the light curve of one of many hundreds of objects within a field, and they were you don't really see it very well on this particular plot, but these points have error bars. This is a high significant source. And they were asked to say, based upon some training they'd be given, whether or not that really looked like a genuine variable. And they were also shown images, snapshot images uh, of the source to say, you know, so they could identify artifacts. They were asked a number of relatively straightforward questions, which culminated in them saying, you know, no, I don't think this is variable. It's an extended blob, which makes it unreliable it looks like some kind of radio imaging artifact, or maybe it's a real bona fide transient or variable. So we set this going um, on December the 7th. We closed it a couple of weeks ago because essentially all our classifications from our initial small data launch were complete. And we launched it with something like 10% of all the Thundercat data. So a relatively small subset of our data. Um, so in that data release, which we released to the public, there were nearly 9,000 unique sources across 11 different Thundercat fields, so about 11 different one square degree fields. This led to 89,000 individual classifications by 1,038 different volunteers. So uh, 
essentially most sources were classified about 10 times, which was our goal. Um, and therefore, you know, at that point, we, 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 um, we announced that the, the project was closed. This corresponds, given the time over which this took, to about one new classification every one to two minutes for a period of about 90 days. Uh, it, it, there's some interesting sociology associated with these projects. So, for example, the top 20, you know, volunteer classifiers each classified over a thousand uh, light curves and objects each. So we needed some way um, of identifying, you know, which were really likely to be the real bona fide transients. Now, when we do this ourselves as astrophysicists with, uh, with uh, you know, much less manpower than a thousand volunteers, we use a couple of diagnostics. So we, we produce a plot like this you see on the right. And we try to use this to identify where interesting sources might be, which of course might be new, exciting, extreme astrophysical transients. So the, the y-axis here is a, is a measure of uh, the, the fractional variability. So this is the amplitude of variability divided by the mean. And the x-axis is simply the, uh, the statistics of a chi-squared, the chi-squared statistic of a fit to a flat line, i.e., you know, once you, once you consider error bars um, is something significantly variable. Um, now, all of the sources which are circled are sources which we as astrophysicists um, because, of course, we'd looked at this data beforehand to a, to a relatively shallow degree, had identified um, as certain or probable variables or transients. All of the objects which are not grey, all of the objects uh, which are coloured, so the purple and blue things down here, are objects which the citizen scientists identified as likely to be real transients and variables. Okay, So there's, obviously, for the things which we classified as variables, they got, they classified as variables as well. But there's a whole bunch of objects, particularly in this part of parameter space, where things, the variability is perhaps a little bit less dramatic, where the citizen scientists said, yes, this looks like a variable, but we wouldn't have necessarily looked into that cloud of points because we'd have needed to look at, well, you know, 9,000 different sources, which is a lot of work. Um, we wanted to figure out some way of identifying what are the most likely ones. So Alex has been looking at this. And at the moment, he has eyeballed um, all of the, the sources for which more than 40% of the volunteers thought it was a real variable. And he's found that about half of those look like they're bona fide variables. So this means that we have about 160 new radio variables and transients just in this small subset of our data. Um, we don't know what they are yet. This is, uh, this is a very small fraction of our initial sample. We don't know what these objects are yet. I'll show you two examples in the following slide, but honestly, there's a lot of potential discovery space here, and this is only going to get better with time. And as I've already mentioned, it's important to focus or, or note the fact that these citizen scientists identified variables and transients that we, as scientists, based upon our preconceptions and limited resource, would have missed. So let me just give you two examples of objects. Um, uh, let me focus first on this, this one here in the, the mid right. So this is an object which varies over time um, with a, a fractional amplitude of variability of about 50%. So the y-axis here is uh, the flux density or the flux that we measure of the synchrotron emission from this source, varying between about 0.9 and 1.6 millijanskis over a period of about a year. Um, these are our best estimates of error bars. So the source has clearly varied, dropped dramatically, and then has risen again towards the, the end. Um, we find a lot of sources which look like this. More than 50%, perhaps more than 80%, we're still working on that, um, look something like this. And these are likely to be low level activity from AGN. It may be intrinsic variability, or it may actually be scintillation. That is that the propagation of the radio waves through the intergalactic medium makes them appear to twinkle. Um, and it's very important, this kind of work is very important because it tells us about the low levels of supermassive black hole activity throughout the universe in a way which perhaps isn't accessible by a, a perhaps studies of optical or x-ray wavelengths. More excitingly, of course, are, you know, bona fide new transients, which, you know, we really don't know what they are. So here's an example um, of an object which uh, had a single bright detection early on and was never detected again in another image. And what we show here is a sequence of three snapshots of the radio image around uh, where this source is. So this is obviously the detection image, and this looks like a radio source. This doesn't look like some kind of weird interferometric artifact. This looks like a real radio source. Um, and in other images, there you know you see all the structured noise that we're used to, but there's just no evidence of a source there at all. And we really don't know what this is. There's no obvious counterpart. 
um, in online catalogs and we're still uh, we're still moving forward. The next steps will be to relaunch this program with a lot more data and also to use our classifications. Remember, we now have 89,000 uh, uh, independent classifications of objects of radio transients or not. And we'll be using those in collaboration with colleagues in South Africa to train machine learning algorithms um, for the first time to, to identify and possibly classify radio transients. And who knows, some of those might turn out to be objects which are very interesting for studies of the, the, the extreme universe um, uh, in the context of things like the Cherenkov Telescope Array. Okay, so I want to change tack again now, um, moving back to um, a, a more specific uh, class of object which has uh, very, very direct relevance for the CTA and the other Cherenkov Telescope Arrays. What I'm representing here um, is work which is led by my, uh, my PhD student, Lauren Rhodes, and this is studies of the radio emission from VHE GRBs. So gamma ray bursts are a phenomena, which I'm sure most, if not all of you are aware, which has been known a long time since the 1960s. They're short duration flashes of gamma rays from space, which probably have two different origins, one associated with the deaths of massive stars, um, and another one associated with the mergers of neutron stars, which are probably also associated with gravitational wave events. In the last two or three years, it's become apparent that some of these gamma ray bursts, and you know, in, in fact, all from the, the longer class of gamma ray burst, um, are detectable with ground-based Cherenkov arrays, such as HESS and MAGIC. And this allows us to probe the very high energy emission from this phenomena in ways which was just not possible previously. Um, so, of course, one very interesting question is, you know, do the ray, does the radio emission from these very high energy gamma ray bursts, does it look like the radio emission from other gamma ray bursts for which there's a large body of theoretical literature and a somewhat smaller body um, of observational results? But, it, you know, there's a well-developed theory of relativistic jets um, behind the radio emission from these GRBs. So Lauren was in a good position um, uh, in the, the first half of her PhD to, to jump straight onto this topic uh, using a couple of the telescopes to which we have access and has studied all of these VHE GRBs at the ra in the um, radio banter in quite some detail. So here's a result from uh, one of the earliest VHE GRBs, GRB 1908-29A. And this is from Rhodes et al 2020. This is one of the best radio data sets ever on any GRB, not just a, a VHE GRB. And it combines observations which we made with the AMI radio telescope uh, here in the UK, and uh, to which I'll return uh, shortly, and also with, uh, with uh, the Meerkat radio telescope, which I've mentioned down in South Africa. Um, this is a, a, an extraordinarily nice data set, um, and what it shows, the combination of the data at the two very different frequencies, 1.3 gigahertz, relatively low frequency and 15 gigahertz, relatively high frequency, showed that there was both um, a forward and a reverse shock uh, uh, in uh, this gamma ray burst. So this means that as the relativistic ejector, as the jet uh, left the gamma ray burst, it propagated into the interstellar medium. Um, in the frame of the interstellar medium, the jets hit it and a shock is propagating through the interstellar medium. In the frame of the jet, the interstellar medium has hit it and a shock is propagating backwards um, uh, through the, the gamma ray, through the jet material. Both of these accelerate um, electrons and produce shocks with similar physics, but different microphysical properties. So our observations suggested that there was an early time reverse shock, which later on became a forward shock. And then at later times, we saw a plateauing or a flattening of the radio emission, which suggested that at late times we were detecting the host galaxy. And there's some interesting detailed physics which came out of this, such as the suggestion that this one exploded into a low density medium um, and had a, a, a relatively low kinetic energy. Um, a more recent paper, which um, is just uh, about to be accepted and in press. So those of you who are interested in this area may see this um, on the archive um, in the next week or so. It's on this GRB, 2012-16C. Uh, now in this uh, GRB, um, this is again a very high energy GRB, but the ratio uh, of gamma rays and X-rays to optical emission uh, means that it can be classified as what we call a dark GRB. So this means it has much lower or significantly lower optical emission than we would expect given typical gamma ray burst models. And the obvious interpretation or the typical interpretation of that is that some of this optical emission is being absorbed by dust 
uh, perhaps in the galaxy or perhaps even in the immediate environment of the GRB. Um, the study of this GRB led to some very interesting results. So as I say, this is from Lauren's paper, which, you'll, which will shortly appear. So she combined some early time optical data with some very detailed radio observations, um, both uh, with a um, e Merlin with Meerkat um, and with the VLA in the United States. And it's impossible to fit a single forward shock model uh, to these, uh, to these ejector, uh, to these data. And a single forward shock model is often fittable to uh, radio data from gamma ray bursts, but in this case it was not. And maybe that's just because uh, these data were very good, or maybe it's because there's something unusual about this event. But the easiest interpretation of what's going on actually is if you look at this schematic over here. So Here's the observer, here's the, the cataclysmic event which produced the gamma ray burst. And as with all gamma ray bursts, a highly relativistic jet came straight towards us. There's a forward shock and that produces um, bright early time radio emission. But it also seems, or it's also uh, uh, easiest to model some of the radio emission um, with a more mildly relativistic, wider angle uh, uh, emission uh, or ejector, perhaps uh, you know, as low Lorentz factor as one or two, which is actually still carrying a significant amount of the kinetic energy and is producing late time radio emission. Well, this is very interesting because this kind of model is actually similar to the models that people have put forward um, for, the, for the gravitational wave uh, gamma ray burst event, GW170870. When Lauren looked at all the gamma ray, the VHE gamma ray burst together, and put them in the context of normal or non-VHE uh, uh, detected uh, gamma rays, uh, gamma ray bursts, it's not clear that there is any difference in the population. So what you see here is a uh, redshift corrected um, uh, uh, days uh, since the burst, um, and this is the, uh, the, uh, the monochromatic luminosity or the radio luminosity from each of these uh, GRBs as a function of time. So the gray points you see in the background are a selection of non VHE GRBs and the blue points are the VHE GRBs which Lauren has been involved in observing at radio wavelengths. Um, the first thing to note is that if you look at the overall distribution of luminosities of these objects then you know and applied for example something like a, a kolmogorov smirnov test you wouldn't be able to see that these populations are different. I mean they're probably given the, the low sample size we can't say that these populations are different. But it is very interesting that note, to note that two of the VHE GRBs um, are particularly low luminosity. Again, that's probably a selection event uh, effect because it's easier to detect the very high energy uh, gamma rays um, uh, when for relatively nearby uh, GRBs. So at the moment, we, uh, we don't know. But of course, you know, it might be that with a bigger sample, we do begin to see some differences. And of course, this is an extremely uh, exciting and interesting area of research potentially for the CTA. OK, so I'm going to talk about one more uh, science uh, area, which I think would be interesting for the CTA, which I'm certain would be interesting for the CTA. And it's observed in the radio band before I just discuss briefly um, a little bit about uh, where radio astronomy and radio arrays are going to go um, in the, the next uh, uh, five to ten years. So excitingly, um, uh, uh, there is a possible association between a relativistic jet from a tidal disruption event um, and the detection of an astrophysical neutrino. So in a nutshell, this story is that we see a supermassive black hole or a, a relatively low mass supermassive black hole, perhaps only a million times the mass of our own sun. So something like the black hole at the center of our own galaxy appears to have torn apart a nearby passing star so that about half the mass of that star becomes tidally bound or becomes gravitationally bound to the black hole and accreted. This produced a burst of accretion onto this supermassive black hole. This produced amongst other things, a powerful relativistic jet. Um, now the radio data um, on this object as I'll show in a moment are so good that we can see that for up to at least half a year after this event began, a powerful jet is being produced and, a bat, and at about half a year, a neutrino was detected by ice cube, which has a fairly strong probability of being astrophysical. So it's a very exciting possible association. So um, let, let me just put these tidal disruption events in context. So this is, a, this is one way of representing the whole range um, uh, of black holes and accretion across the universe. So what I'm plotting here is the, the mass uh, of black holes. And what I'm plotting here is the the relative or fractional rate of accretion onto these black holes in units of Eddington, which means that this should be about as high as they can go. 
So the X-ray binaries I was talking about earlier um, in the context of the Thundercat project, they're at the, the lower end, and that's actually handy because we can we think we understand how those can be created. They're in the same mass range as the, the LIGO uh, uh, black holes um, and neutron stars, which we see. At the highest mass end are the most massive AGN at high accretion rates, and at the highest mass but low accretion rates around 87, which has been so spectacularly imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope. The tidal disruption events um, are supermassive black holes, but as I say, perhaps only a million or 10 million solar masses. And because they um, experience very rapid changes in their accretion rate, we actually think that we can, we can understand a lot of what they're doing in the context of patterns that we've learned about X-ray binaries. So that makes them of particular interest to me. But of course, the, you know, the possible detection of very high energy emission, I think, makes them uh, very interesting to, to all of you. Um, so this is uh, these results are from a paper uh, published by Stein et al. Um, last year. They made the cover of Nature Astronomy a new source of neutrinos. And in a nutshell, then, for those of you who haven't seen these kind of schematics before, the idea is that a star passes um, too close to the, the gravitational influence of a supermassive black hole. It becomes distorted. Something like half of the star ends up spiraling towards the black hole, producing an accretion disk and ultimately a jet the other half is unbound and basically splayed out uh, across the environment of that black hole. The ice, cre the ice cube uh, neutrino detector detected detection of a probable astrophysical neutrino prompted a search with Zwicky, which is an optical transients facility. Zwicky found in looking at their data that there'd been an optical variable in the direction of this neutrino for actually half a year already. And the combination of the optical monitoring with the neutrino detection and then subsequently radio monitoring put together a really nice story. So um, uh, this is time since discovery um, of the TDE, but what you should start off by looking at is that this vertical dotted line here, this is the time when the astrophysical neutrino was probably detected. Now IceCube independently estimates this has something like a 60% probability to be astrophysical. So that's, uh, that's tempting, but it's not super convincing. However, a, a jet bright tidal disruption event in the same patch of sky combined with this brings the probability down to significantly less than 1%. So actually makes us moderately confident they're associated. Um, and what could be seen then looking at the, uh, the, the optical data was that there'd been an optical variable identified now as a tidal disruption event for half a year before the neutrino was discovered. Excuse me. In radio monitoring observations, we now can see, or we could see um, then, um, that there was something unusual going on in the radio. So what I'm showing you here um, uh, is a sequence of radio spectra from one gigahertz uh, to about uh, 15 or 16 gigahertz, taken at four different epochs, so between 40 days and 180 days after this initial event. So, and recall the neutrino was detected around the time um, of this last epoch of radio observations. The key point to take away here is that there is a peak at all times in the radio spectrum. And that very strongly implies not only that there is ongoing energy injection um, into uh, whatever that's producing this radio emission, a relativistic jet, but also that we can calculate the size of the ejector from, um, from measuring that peak. So we're able to do that and we're able to see that um, uh, this is since a function of time. We can make measurements associated with these four peaks. We get the size of the ejector as a function of time, which tells us that it's expanding mildly relativistically. And we get the internal energy, which tells us that energy was still being pumped into this jet, um, at least up to the point where the uh, neutrino was detected. So there's a very nice circumstantial background picture here, which suggests that a very powerful jet from this black hole was being produced at the time the neutrino was detected. And I think this is, you know, this is a very exciting probability. Um, the reason that this is exciting, or one of the reasons this is exciting, is that if you see the neutrinos, it tells you that uh, uh, hadronic processes, i.e. processes associated with a, with a proton, are involved. Whereas if you just see gamma rays alone, then this could also always just come from uh, leptonic processes, such as direct synchrotron or inverse Compton emission. Um, so this is a summary of what we saw, um, and I recommend those of you who are interested and haven't read it already to read Stein et al. 2021. So those were the, the astrophysical things um, or, or radio sources that I wanted to highlight, a subset of all the things that's going on in the radio band. But I just wanted to give you a little um, uh, feel for what's going on then with the development of radio telescopes. 
And over the next five or 10 years, we're really looking at a development from the current new generation, which are fantastic, towards the square kilometre array and the next generation VLA. But I think it does raise a question of where will we get our high cadence monitoring data from, which has been really essential for these transient studies. So um, here's a picture uh, of Meerkat, um, as it was, as it is today, and as it was at its inauguration two years ago. Um, on a timescale of about five years, Meerkat will become SKA1 mid. So that means the mid frequency component of the square kilometer array. For all of the science that I have talked about today, all of the synchrotron uh, science, this is going to be the most exciting and important component of the SKA, and it's going to be the most important radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. It's going to increase the sensitivity of Meerkat, which is already extremely sensitive, by an order of magnitude and increase the angular resolution by more than an order of magnitude. There is another component, a low frequency component, which is under construction in Australia, but my sense is that for most of our physics, um, it's going to be a little bit less important. The next generation VLA, um, it's hoped to start construction on around, on around the same time scale, and it's hoped that um, it will be at a stage by the end of this decade that will be more sensitive than the existing VLA and maybe has full operations if it gets fully funded by about 2035. And that will in turn be the most powerful radio telescope in the Northern Hemisphere. So this is already a shiny new radio telescope producing fantastic results. And the future is looking very, very bright that this has become more powerful and more exciting. And it's a very exciting time for radio studies of transients. However, let me just raise one point for you to think about. Um, <clears throat> so the SKA or the next generation VLA, if you're using something in the Northern Hemisphere, will be the main facility for radio science in the 2030s. And it may well be that in the era um, of the SKA, the other radio facilities become mothballed because it can, it's the nature of the beast with radio telescopes that it can do essentially everything. However, as you all have seen, a lot of the science that we've done um, uh, over recent years, some of which I've highlighted, has been with sources which are much brighter than you need the SKA sensitivity for. Um, and if we only use the SKA to its fullest capabilities of observing very faint objects, we'll miss a lot of these nearby objects. We don't need this sub micro sensitivity to monitor a lot of these bright transients. Now, optical astronomy also faced this issue and optical astronomy responded by building large numbers of small telescopes to do optical transient surveys. However, the radio astronomy world might not do this. And the reason the radio astronomy world might not do this is because the SKA can in principle do this as well. So remember, even though it's a large array, it, it also has a wide field of view. It could potentially subarray, which means you could you could branch off small numbers of antennas to do monitoring of bright sources. But my concern is that, you know, will this really happen? This will make scheduling extremely complex. And I can imagine and I could imagine being in their shoes, people proposing to observe extraordinarily deep with the SKA will not want some transient scientists using 10 or 20 of their antennas to monitor some tidal disruption about gamma ray burst. Uh, gravitational word, uh, 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 gravitational wave merger event. So another possibility is which I'd like to seed into your mind um, is that maybe, it, you know, now is the time to consider actually building a small dedicated array in the Southern Hemisphere for rapid radio follow-up and monitoring of transients and radio emission associated um, with, uh, with extreme astrophysical sources. And, you know, and I just, I'll, I'll highlight the case of AMI, which is a radio telescope we use all the time. This is two antennas of the AMI Large Array. This is me with some of my team when we visited a few years ago. Um, there's actually six uh, uh, antennas used in uh, AMI. It has short baselines. The dishes are more than 50 years old. It's extraordinary. This is very old. Um, the dishes are very good condition. You can use them up to high frequencies and we use them all the time. Um, and they are monitoring transients more than 30% of their program. It's an extraordinary program, high cadence. We are associated with many, many publications, lots of nature and science uh, uh, papers. These figures here are just a number of figures where Amy has made a vital contribution to extreme transients astrophysics just in the last <laughs> Um, so this is, for example, this is uh, the light curve I was showing you earlier of a stellar mass black hole. This is the neutrino TDE. Amy contributed to that study. This is a long-term study of a jet from a different type of TDE. 
This is radio flaring from a cataclysmic rail, that is a white dwarf. This is radio monitoring of the extraordinary um, uh, radio history um, of, a, of a transformative uh, supernovae. Um, and this is, uh, this is radio monitoring um, of the very high energy gamma ray uh, burst, all of which, you know, Amy made a, a very important contribution to. So you don't need SK to do all, any of this. And so my concern is that perhaps this stuff won't get done if we only have SKA. So perhaps, you know, I just see the idea in your minds, perhaps we do need our own dedicated um, uh, radio transient array or arrays to do this kind of work in the future and really support the work of things like the Cherenkov Telescope Array. All right. So I will wrap up there. Uh, radio transient um, studies, I hope I've uh, convinced you, is an extremely exciting field. It's a growing field, um, and we're getting to play with a lot of really exciting new radio telescopes and discovering lots of things. Nearly everything we're studying has a counterpart at higher energies, and there's real synergies between studies in X-rays, gamma rays, um, and the radio band. Meerkat's our favorite toy at the moment. My group and others around the world are getting extraordinary science out of this, um, covering uh, black holes of all masses, gamma ray bursts. And also, you know, really opening up this field of commensal transients, just doing transient surveys where you find the transients for the first time in the radio band. And I love the fact that we're doing this with citizen scientists. It's really, it's really been a fantastic story. So I think the future is very bright for synergy between radio um, observations and Cherenkov um, uh, and, and other high energy telescopes. But I do, as I say, you know, just think, let's think about whether or not the SK alone will deliver everything we need to monitor these sources. And I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and um, I'm very happy to take any questions.